I will begin with the narrative, with the story, to introduce the central figure of my talk today. On a spring day in March 1939, a crowd of a few hundred people gathered on a platform at the Delhi train station, eagerly anticipating someone's arrival. Their enthusiasm peaked as the train carrying this person reached the platform. A thin and elderly, yet tall and commanding man came off the train amid thundering cheers from the assembled crowd as people competed to catch a glimpse of him. This man's name was Ubaidullah Sindhi, died 1944. A prominent yet curious Indian Muslim scholar whose life and career had taken a course quite unlike that of his peers in the Indian Muslim scholarly elite. On this day, Sindhi had returned to India after being in exile for 25 years. 25 years ago, Sindhi left India for Kabul and Afghanistan at the behest of his mentor, someone called Mahmood Hassan, died 1920, a major scholar of the North Indian Deoband Seminary, established in 1867. Sindhi was charged with the task of leading a conspiracy movement to topple the British colonial government in India. An avid anti-colonial thinker and activist, Sindhi spent seven years in Kabul, and from there on he traveled to the Soviet Union, where he stayed for three months, Turkey, where he lived for four years, and finally Mecca, where he lived for 12 years before returning to India. On returning to India, unknown to many who had come that day to welcome his arrival at the Delhi train station, Sindhi had transformed from an arch anti-colonialist to a staunch believer in a socialist revolution inspired by the Quran. More specifically, he had become a dogged proponent of a socio-economic and indeed a moral revolution in Kalab that combined the socialist promise of proletariat emancipation with what he regarded as the egalitarian revolutionary ethos of the Quran. Sindhi spent the last five years of his life until his death in August 1944 trying to convince Indian Muslims of the need to recognize and embrace the urgency of such a revolutionary program. My talk today engages some fragments of Sindhi's life and thought with the purpose of presenting an example of the translation and reconfiguration of the Muslim intellectual canon, primarily the Quran, for decisively modern political projects and aspirations. More specifically, by highlighting the interpretive procedures or the hermeneutical procedures through which Ubaidullah Sindhi read the Quran as a manifesto for revolution, I hope to show ways in which the political conceptual terrain of colonial modernity informed and generated new imaginaries of Islam and approaches to reading and translating the Quran. So in this talk, I approach translation, the word translation, less as the movement from one language to another, as it is conventionally understood, and more as the interpretive mechanisms through which texts like the Quran are translated and mobilized for particular, thank you very much, for particular ideological and political purposes. Let me begin with a brief overview of Sindhi's religious and political career as a way to contextualize his intellectual thought and output, especially his Quran commentary, which will be the focus of the talk today. So who was Ubaidullah Sindhi? I will move in three parts today. The first part would be an overview of Ubaidullah Sindhi's life and thought. Second part, I will provide you with a general conceptual overview of his intellectual project. And the third part will be more specific analysis of his Quran commentary. That's how we will proceed. Ubaidullah Sindhi was born into a traditional Sikh family in the village of Chilan Wali in Sialkot district in British Punjab in 1872. His name, until he became Muslim, was Bhuta Singh. When Sindhi was 12, a Hindu classmate in school <coughs> gifted him a copy of the Persian text Tohfatul Hind, Gift of India. This text was apparently written by a Hindu convert to Islam from Malar Kotla in Punjab, who had later become a Muslim scholar known as Maulana Ubaidullah. So taken was the young Bhuta Singh with Ubaidullah's conversion narrative and by this text, that not only did he embrace Islam in 1887 at the age of 15, he also adopted the name Ubaidullah upon his conversion. In 1888, Sindhi enrolled as a student at the prestigious Muslim seminary in Deoband, Uttar Pradesh, the Deoband Madrasa in North India, established in 1867. 
At Deoband, Sindhi studied and prospered under the tutelage of the towering scholar Mahmud Hassan, popularly known as Sheikh ul Hind, the Sheikh of India. Sindhi distinguished himself as a scholar in all traditional Islamic disciplines, such as the Quran, Hadith, Islamic jurisprudence. He also mastered Arabic. Now, in 1915, at the height of World War I, Mahmud Hassan, himself a noted anti colonial activist, dispatched Sindhi to Kabul with the task of establishing there a branch of the Indian National Congress that was led by Gandhi but had significant participation of Muslim scholars also. In Kabul, Sindhi's task was to lead an anti colonial conspiracy movement to bring an end to British rule in India. Accompanied by a band of devoted followers, including many non Muslims, Sindhi traveled to Kabul via Balochistan. He stayed in Kabul for seven years until 1922. In Kabul, Sindhi launched and managed a transnational conspiracy movement to overthrow the British, known as the Silk Handkerchief Movement, Reshmi Rumal Tehreek. This name owed to the multicolored pieces of silk cloth on which the participants of this movement would exchange letters between Kabul, Delhi, and Mecca, where Mahmud Hassan had moved, fleeing the British. When the British caught whiff of these subversive plans, they pressured Habibullah Khan, the then Afghan ruler, to hand Sindhi over to them. The British had charged Sindhi with sedition. While Khan did not oblige, he nonetheless put Sindhi in jail. Sindhi was imprisoned for four years until 1919, reportedly in torrid conditions, and tortured on an almost daily basis. He was released only after Habibullah's assassination in February 1919 and the eventual succession of his son Amanullah Khan as the new Afghan king. Eventually, Sindhi was compelled to flee Afghanistan in 1922 as the British pressure on Amanullah to hand Sindhi over became impossible to withstand. But despite his political failures, Sindhi's seven years in Kabul transformed him as a scholar and as a person in profound ways. Living in the midst of Amanullah's aggressive modernization drive, in Kabul, Sindhi began to internalize what one might call a narrative of civilizational progress, permeating minute aspects of everyday life. For example, Sindhi would later reminisce that it was in Kabul that he learned the use of forks and knives while dining. Apparently, during Sindhi's first few days in Kabul, his inability to use Western cutlery in formal gatherings with the Afghan political leaders had brought him great embarrassment. So much so that after vowing to overcome this deficiency, one day he spent hours at a stretch from morning to evening to master Western dining etiquettes. Similarly, Sindhi also took it upon himself to learn chess. Apparently, he had taken to heart the advice he was given by some members of the Afghan political elite that to be taken seriously as a political leader and not as, and here I quote, just another mullah, Sindhi must acquire three things. One, proper dining skills. Two, proficiency in chess. And three, a taste and habit for consuming naswar, a traditional Pashtun narcotic ingested by being placed between the lower lip and the gum. If the seven years in Kabul precipitated Sindhi's cultural transformation, the next four and a half in Russia and then in Turkey further catalyzed that process, often in unexpected ways. From Kabul, Sindhi moved to Moscow, where he spent seven months in 1922. As a known dissident of the British Empire, Sindhi was given official protocol in Russia on his arrival, and he said to have kept company and shared conversations with leading figures of the Soviet intelligentsia. With legends of, while legends of a meeting with Stalin still circulate, Sindhi himself denied any such encounter. Even so, this short stay in Russia exposed Sindhi to an idea and political current that in many ways defined his intellectual career for the rest of his life, the idea of revolution. Sindhi was mesmerized by the promise of a socialist revolution. And although he was opposed to its irreligious character, he found the emancipatory narrative of a proletariat revolution immensely attractive. Sindhi's fascination with the idea of revolution further matured during his four-year stay in Istanbul in Turkey, where he moved from Russia in 1922 on the eve of the abolition of the Ottoman Caliphate and the establishment of the Turkish Republic. If socio-economic revolution was the central theme that dominated Sindhi's imagination in Russia, in Turkey it was secularism. More so than the separation of religion and politics, what most captured Sindhi's attention were cultural aspects of Mustafa Kemal's secularism, 
such as the banning of headscarves and the adoption of Western habits and everyday practices. Years later, on returning to India, Sindhi would openly oppose the donning of headscarves, causing much fury and condemnation in Muslim traditionalist circles. Having experienced the immediate aftermath of the War of Independence and the foundation of the new Turkish Republic, Sindhi's stay in Turkey only confirmed his conviction in the inevitability of a global enveloping revolution that, in his view, no society could any longer ignore or remain unaffected by. This revolutionary movement that had swept aside long-running monarchies and spiritual come political institutions like the Caliphate would soon confront India and Indian Muslims, Sindhi warned. Sindhi spent the next 12 years of his life from 1927 from to 1939 in Mecca, where he devoted himself to crafting an intellectual project of translating the promise of an economic socialist revolution through the canon of Muslim normative sources, especially the Quran. For this task, Sindhi took as his intellectual inspiration and guide the renowned 18th century Indian Muslim thinker Shah Wali Ullah, who died in 1762. Of all thinkers in Muslim and South Asian Muslim intellectual history, Sindhi regarded Wali Ullah and his political and philosophical thought most relevant to the moral and political landscape of early 20th century. This was so because in his writings, Waliullah had derided the nobility of late Mughal India for their profligate habits and had called for a complete overhaul of the political order, as exemplified in his mobilization of the trope, unraveling of every order, fakku kulli nidamin. In addition to analytical commentaries and expositions on Waliullah's philosophical and political thought, in Mecca, Sindhi also composed an important commentary on the Quran, appropriately entitled The Quranic Conscience of Revolution, Qurani Shu'ure in Qala. In this 600 page Quran commentary in Urdu, interspersed with Arabic, Sindhi attempted to show the centrality of the idea of revolution to the Quran and to the venture of Islam more broadly. So now I will turn to a discussion of some of the key conceptual and thematic features of this commentary to highlight some of the ways in which Sindhi presented the Quran as a manifesto for revolution. For Sindhi, the Quran was in essence a revolutionary text that called for a global revolution premised on annihilating the unjust and elevating the dispossessed. Revelation and revolution were inseparable. Moreover, in Sindhi's view, Class struggle was at the heart of the Quran and of Muhammad's prophetic career. The revolutionary intervention of the Quran lay in the annihilation of two major imperial powers of the 7th century, the Romans and the Persians, Qaisar wa Qasra. But these two empires not only represented political and spatial entities, Sindhi argued, rather, Romanness and Persianness, Qaisariyat wa Qasrawiyat, represented mindsets of imperial elitism that were destroyed by Islam and replaced by the equalizing power of divine sovereignty. The major sins of such elitism were extravagance, oppression of the underprivileged, and the monopolization of financial and political power by a small elite. All sins that Sindhi categorized as falling under the biggest sin of what he called capital worship, Sarmaya Parasti. In his view, the underlying motif of a Quranic revolution was to overthrow such regimes of capital worship and to replace them with a political order that elevated the dispossessed and that ensured a just and egalitarian society. Sindhi's socioeconomic program and hermeneutics, or his interpretive mechanisms, were anchored on a political theology, meaning how theology and politics come together, were anchored on a political theology that combined a theology of radical divine sovereignty with a politics of radical human freedom. How? Submission to a sovereign divine, Sindhi argued, was meant to free humans from dependence on all other forms of oppressive power and hierarchies. Moreover, Sindhi presented the classical Muslim theological imperative to seek help from no other entity but God in explicitly political terms. For instance, he translated the iconic statement the iconic verse, you, God alone we worship, in the Fatiha, as a supplication for what he called, for, as a supplication for the establishment of what he called a Quranic revolutionary party, 
This Quranic revolutionary party was tasked with fashioning a political order that at first resisted and eventually eliminated two kinds of elitism. One, intellectual elitism, or what Sindhi also called Brahmanism, and economic elitism, or what he called capitalism. In its beginning stages, this revolutionary movement was to remain national, Qaumi. Every international movement must begin locally among a people who spoke a common language, Sindhi argued. Eventually, after achieving a solid platform, leadership, and adequate preparation, it takes on an international identity. So, for example, in the beginning years of Islam, the Arabs represented what Sindhi called the central committee of the international revolution that Muhammad had ushered. Later, after a few decades, the geographically and linguistically concentrated revolution of Islam assumed a global character. Now, among the most fascinating aspects of Sindhi's discourse was the way he couched his emancipatory political theology in a narrative of civilizational progress. He, as he declared, and here I quote, a progressive society, taraqqiqun mu'ashara, must only beseech God for its needs. This is the guarantor of human freedom. End of quote. A just and free society, the English word society used by Sindhi, was only possible through absolute submission to the divine sovereign. Now, what I wish to emphasize here is the way in which Sindhi reconfigured and translated the centuries-old concept of divine sovereignty in the explicitly modern language of progress or taraqqi. My point is this. His liberationist Quranic hermeneutic was indebted to and indeed made possible by a moral and political discourse that privileged progress as a normative ideal to be desired and strived for in the first place. The point being, the very ideal that he was desiring was itself thoroughly modern. The new conditions of modernity made it possible for him to even desire that ideal of progress. However, having said that, a cautionary note is in order here. Despite its modernist overtones, Sindhi's discourse did not translate into an uncritical embrace of Western modernity. In fact, he explicitly stated that modern European revolutions lacked the comprehensiveness of the revolution propounded by the Quran. Moreover, while drawing from a modern secular conceptual vocabulary as reflected in his championing of progress, Sindhi's discourse was thoroughly grounded in a narrative of religious salvation. In fact, he even argued that the most insidious aspect of economic injustice was that it dissipated humanity's, humanity's capacity for salvation. Also, the perpetrators of such injustice were not only bound for humiliation in this world, they were also eschatologically doomed, meaning doomed in the afterlife. In other words, theology and salvation were central to his discourse. So the point is this. While Sindhi was clearly inspired by European discourses on progress, his call for revolution was not premised on a secular liberal teleology that equated progress with jettisoning, removing, or moderating religion and salvational aspirations. Rather, and to the contrary, his mobilization of modernist tropes such as progress was folded into a program of revolution that was unflinchingly theological. Now, this is not to posit a binary, an opposition between the secular and the theological. As many scholars have shown, the secular itself is deeply theological. But to simply point out that Sindhi's appropriation of modern secular symbols and desires was not premised on a push away from religion or on an unquestioning embrace of Western modernity. While drawing from modern secular tropes, Sindhi was at the same time selective and critical about how he engaged in that appropriation. What we find in his thought then is a dynamic process of translation, whereby a traditional source of Muslim normativity, such as the Quran, was recast and translated so as to secure and punctuate the urgency of its epistemic and political significance to the modern moment. So having provided a broad conceptual skeleton of Sindhi's intellectual project, I will now turn to some specific places in his Quran commentary to give you a more precise sense of the ways he framed and translated the Quran as a manifesto for revolution. Throughout his Quran commentary, Sindhi interpreted particular verses and passages in the Quran 
through entirely novel conceptual vocabularies. For purposes of illustration, I will briefly touch on his commentary on two related chapters in the Quran. I will just focus on two chapters to provide you with a sense of how he works through, how he operates in his text. Surah, uh, chapter number 73, Surah Al-Muzzammil, which is commonly translated as the enwrapped one or the enfolded one, and chapter 74, Surah Al-Muddathir, the one enveloped, as it is usually translated as. His commentary on these two chapters brings together several of the major conceptual and theological features that characterize his Quran commentary and hermeneutic as a whole. According to Sindhi, Al-Muzzammil and Al-Muddathir were conjoined through a common manifesto for revolution. In fact, one was the completion of the other. What was left ambiguous in Al-Muzzammil was elaborated in Al-Muddathir and vice versa. Among the earliest Meccan chapters, central to the agenda of both these chapters, Sindhi argued, was a scathing repudiation, a scathing uh, rejection of what he called a capital worshipping mindset. This is the key term that he keeps on coming back to, a capital worshipping mindset. Sarmaya Parastana Zahniyat. Sindhi claimed that these two chapters provided a roadmap for the realization of a revolutionary movement that would confront and eviscerate such an exploitative mindset. Much of Sindhi's commentary on these chapters was focused on, re on revealing their revolutionary import, generating unexpected interpretive moves and outcomes. As a case in point, consider his understanding of the term al-Muzammil, commonly translated as the enwrapped or enfolded one. In the Muslim tradition of Quran commentaries, this chapter has usually been interpreted as a testament to the heightened spiritual consciousness of Muhammad, as reflected in the image of Prophet Muhammad enwrapped and enfolded in a cloak while engaged in prayers. The intensity of the Prophet's piety, in turn, is presented as a normative example of devotion and spiritual discipline for all Muslims to emulate. However, in Sindhi's hands, this surah turned into a practical manual for an aspiring revolutionary. For one, he mined an alternative translation of the word muzammil. That can also mean making someone a friend or a colleague, tazmil, the second verbal form of the Arabic root zamala. Sindhi ingeniously argued that muzammil here referred to the divine command to assemble and gather together what he called comrades for the establishment of a Quranic revolutionary party. Now, uh, on your handout, I think on the second side of it, the second page, there are some, um, let me see which, yeah, on the second page, uh, there are some verses that I've lifted, uh, listed in translation, and I will keep on going back and forth. I will let you know, uh, to give you a reference of the verses that I will be analyzing here, uh, Cindy's commentary, it will give you a reference point uh, to take a look at them. The second and third verses of this chapter, which uh, comes as, I think item number six of your handout, perhaps, the second and third verses yeah. of this chapter, read as follows. Keep awake in prayer at night, but not all night, half of it or a little less. And verse six states, and verily, during the hours of night, the mind is freshest and the speech clearest. Now, most Quran commentators have read these verses as injunctions authorizing supererogatory or extra nightly prayers, the hajjud in Islam. However, in Sindhi's view, the devotional content of these verses provided a daily plan of action for a revolutionary comrade. The night, Sindhi explained, was a time for devotion and preparation for revolution through an intense routine of reciting, reading, and absorbing the revolutionary message of the Quran. In other words, in his view, the hours of the night had been designated by God as a time for learning and reflecting on the manifesto for revolution, the Quran. Why? Because late at night, a person was free from the thought and responsibility of work and home, and could thus focus on intellectual exertion and discussion with a sharper mind. The day then was to be devoted for venturing to the public for the propagation of the Quran's revolutionary program. Similarly, as part of his commentary on al muddathir Sindhi advanced a rather curious reading of verse 6, which is also on your handout. It reads as follows. And do not, through giving, seek yourself to gain. According to Sindhi, this verse represented a stern indictment of the idea of surplus value. 
a concept that he described as extracting labor in excess of what the laborer is paid. For instance, paying a laborer four cents and extracting worth and extracting work worth 10 cents or charging exorbitant amounts of money for the provision of education, these were all symptoms of a capital worshipping mindset. What I wish to emphasize here is this. It's not just the content of Cindy's discourse that we should focus on, as fascinating and at times ambiguous as it is, but rather to the way he connected a pithy Quranic verse to a decidedly modern political conceptual terrain propelled by such concepts as surplus value. In another remarkable moment in his commentary, Sindhi argued that Surat al-Muddathir advanced a psychosocial analysis of the opponents of a Quranic revolution. In his rendition of this analysis, Sindhi drew curious parallels between the condition of unbelievers as described in al-Muddathir and that of the modern capitalist elite. To give you a flavor of this argument, I will walk you through Sindhi's commentary on six specific verses uh, in the surah. Verses 11 to 17, which is the final term on your handout. Uh, verses 11 to 17 have been listed in translation. Verse 11 of the surah, in verse 11 of the surah, Surah Al-Mudathir, God says, Leave me alone to deal with him whom I have created lonely. This verse simultaneously announces humanity's utter loneliness and dependence on God while also signaling God's absolute sovereignty over the fate of humans, forgetful of that sovereignty. According to Sindhi, however, this verse and the following few verses sketched a picture of the psychological condition of a Quranic revolution's opponent. This picture, as in turn sketched by Sindhi, mirrored the persona of a spoiled brat born into a rich industrialist family. Sindhi explained that this verse described the only child of rich parents raised with all possible pomp and privilege. Raised surrounded by every comfort and luxury, this child was also the sole owner of the wealth and property of his father that he inherited. In Sindhi's view, while the psychological state that this child develops as he grows is the subject of the next few verses, in this verse God assures humanity that it must not worry about, that it must not worry and that he alone will deal with such people. The life narrative and psychological condition of this capitalist elite continues to be presented in the next two verses that read, and I created for him wealth, God saying, and I created for him wealth, uh, verse number 12, and then, and children who are always by his side, verse number 13. While commenting on verse 12, Sindhi opined that as this privileged child grows and becomes a young man, he finds himself the owner of multiple industrial and agricultural businesses, as wealth and affluence shower him. Sindhi's commentary on verse 13 represents among the most fascinating examples of his focus on the social dimension of bourgeois capitalist life. According to him, the reason why this rich industrialist agriculturalist can afford the time to have his children always by his side, as it is said in verse 13, and children who are always by his side, the reason for that is that his laborers, the laborers of this agriculturalist, in both factories and the fields, do all his work, endlessly expending their sweat and labor. In the meantime, the main activity that preoccupies this business tycoon is that of lounging in club rooms, the word club rooms used by Sindhi, with his friends, killing endless hours in idle talk and chatter. Over time, this wealth multiplies, as indicated in the next verse, verse 14, and I made his life easy and comfortable. But despite all this wealth and comfort, as the next verse says, and yet he greedily desires that I, that is God, that I give yet more. In Sindhi's commentary on this verse, he asserted that despite being blessed with immense wealth, this capital worshiper always desires to find ways of compounding that wealth. All he cares about are his investments and capital, so he may keep, so he may keep progressing materially. The condition and welfare of his laborers and peasants does not interest the capital worshipper. Similarly, the thought of the poor and underprivileged classes in society does not cross his mind. In fact, he actively tries to deny them education that might enable their socioeconomic elevation, fearing that such elevation of the underprivileged may detract his own status and monopoly over wealth. It is at this point 
that God declares this capital worshipper as an enemy of his, as reflected in the next verse, verse 16. Nay, are signs he stubbornly opposes. <clears throat> and in the next verse, God ominously declares, I will make him endure a painful uphill climb in the afterlife, verse 17. In his commentary, Sindhi took this verse as an ironic play on the idea of progress. A capital worshipper who opposes Prophet Muhammad's revolutionary program of socioeconomic justice thinks and believes that his worldly material success equates to progress in life. But this notion of his is a fanciful mistake. In fact, the taller he climbs in this world, the more rapid and painful his fall will be in the afterlife. Sindhi sketched a chillingly vivid picture of the fate that will meet this capital worshipper. After being thrown in hell, he will be made to climb a steep mountain, as shown in verse 17. While climbing this mountain, at first he will think as if he's making progress, as if he's progressing upwards. But soon he will realize that for every step that he takes upwards, he falls down a few more steps. This will leave him utterly perplexed and he will remain mired in the tormenting cycle of going up and down with no reprieve. The fantasy of progress that he entertained in this world will quite, will quite literally be turned upside down in the afterlife. This will be the punishment of equating progress with material wealth and of neglecting the less privileged and the poor in society. Now, an important point. Although Sindhi engaged new ideas and concepts in his Quran commentary, he did not understand his exegetical labor as a work of innovation that entailed radical hermeneutical, meaning radical interpretive liberties. Rather, he saw his work primarily as one of reinvigorating the revolutionary mandate of the Quran that he found buried under the rubble of conventional and predictable commentaries on the Quran. In Sindhi's hermeneutical imaginary, in his religious imaginary, even and perhaps especially, the seemingly devotional verses of the Quran were signs, were ayat, of a revolutionary political project of socio-economic justice. Politics and devotional practices were mutually entangled. What these examples show is the way in which the anticipation for revolution propelled Sindhi's hermeneutics, his interpretive mechanism, pushing the parameters of existing Quranic exegetical norms in the process. Central to Sindhi's interpretive apparatus was the argument that the devotional and eschatological moments in the Quran, meaning moments to do with the afterlife, were deeply political. Moreover, he insisted that a superficial reading of the Quran and of such devotional moments would hide and puncture the revolutionary politics of socioeconomic justice at the heart of the Quran. And it is this revolutionary historical sensibility of the Quran that, in his view, most commentators of the Quran in Muslim intellectual history had failed to discern and appreciate. Hence, their interpretation of the Quran could not approach the text beyond the prism of individual events in the Prophet's life nor capture the call for political action that underlay seemingly devotional verses. The reason for such myopia, Sindhi guessed, he surmised, was that by the time Quran commentary tradition became active in the 9th century, the revolutionary force of Islam's beginning moments had dissipated, thus escaping Muslim commentators' interpretive canvas. It is this revolutionary force of the Quran and of Islam that Sindhi sought to recover and re-energize through his commentary and indeed through his intellectual output more broadly. Coming back to his life as a way to conclude this talk. The intellectually cosmopolitan environment of Mecca, where Sindhi lived from 1927 to 1939, provided him a highly profitable venue and a broad transnational audience for his project, especially during the Hajj every year. During his stay in Mecca, in addition to scholarship, Sindhi also occupied himself with regular study circles in which he taught Shawali Ullah's texts, among other topics, to a number of students from different parts of the world. Many of them, such as the Russian Muslim modernist Musa Jarullah, who later translated Sindhi's Quran commentary into Russian, went on to become influential Muslim scholars in their own regard. 
Eventually, in 1939, after almost 25 years in exile, Sindhi returned to India after the British uh, dropped charges of sedition against him. The last five years of his life, despite his failing health, were hectic. In addition to opening an institute devoted to propagating the teachings of Shah Waliullah, called Shah Waliullah Academy, he also launched a political party that he called the Sindh Sagar Party. Apparently, despite being very ill with tuberculosis and being almost destitute, Sindhi would walk long distances from his home to the Jame Mosque in Delhi to avoid the bus fare, to deliver sermons and to hold study circles on Shah Ullah's teachings and texts. His writings and speeches during this time reveal a consistent theme of him informing and warning Indian Muslims of a looming revolution that he had seen and experienced, but that according to him, the Indian Muslim masses were only too blissfully ignorant about. Sindhi's legacy remains contentious. While some see him, for example, in his own school, the Deoband Madrasa, while some see him as a visionary scholar who was years ahead of his time and who successfully identified problems that would later haunt South Asian Muslims in vexing ways, others regard him as an eccentric, radical, marginal to the ulama tradition in South Asia, who they argued, and here I quote, one scholar, had gone mad in exile. Conclusion. The central conceptual point I wish to make through this talk is this. Sindhi's translation and reconfiguration of the Quran as a manifesto for revolution illustrates ways in which new political anticipations and imaginaries enter into a particular discursive tradition at specific historical conjunctures shifting and expanding the interpretive boundaries and possibilities of that tradition in the process. Indeed, what we find in Sindhi's commentary is a translation of the Quran invested in engaging with and responding to the perils and possibilities of modernity. For Sindhi, translation entailed not just the movement from one language to another, but rather the epistemic transfer of a text to new conceptual and political spaces. This project of translation involved the recovery of the prophetic past for the fashioning of a future leavened by the ethos of revolution and grounded in the promise of socioeconomic justice and emancipation. In Sindhi's view, the vitality of the Quran in the present depended on absorbing, energizing, and mobilizing the revolutionary fervor that had once destroyed world empires and that had united disparate communities under the flag of monotheism and divine sovereignty. Through this labor of epistemic translation, Sindhi strived to excavate and advance the Quran's manifesto for revolution, a manifesto that he found at once urgently needed to confront the global revolutionary currents of the 20th century, and yet morally <coughs> superior to those currents. So although he was inspired by European revolutionary currents and saw this moment as a way to respond to those currents, but he also found the Quran's revolutionary project as ultimately superior to those currents because of its moral and religious foundation, which he found lacking in other revolutionary currents and movements of that time. Today, we live in the present that represents the ruins of the future that Sindhi had imagined and conceived. And his desire and anticipation for revolution no longer seems as urgent as it once may have. Nonetheless, his attempt at translating Islam and the Quran as a revolutionary movement and text brings into view an important illustration of how new political aspirations during the modern colonial moment enabled and inspired new hermeneutical registers and new ways of reimagining Islam as an ongoing discursive tradition. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>